What's up, Mandate family? In this episode, I'm joined by my friend Brian Wang. He's now an executive coach, but before that, he was a founder of a successful startup. He worked in VC, he's worked in product, but he really felt this pull and this calling to become a coach. So we're gonna talk a little bit about coaching, but we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about feelings and what you can do to get more in touch with your feelings, to really explore them, to be open to them, to be curious about them, so that you can drive more understanding that should lead to growth in your life. We've got a lot of vulnerable moments coming up in this episode. Uh, shout out to Brian for being so open with what he shared today. And that is just a hint of what we're gonna get into. But since you're here, if you've got a moment, hit that subscribe button, turn on those alerts, give us a like, leave us a comment. I'd love to know what you think about this, ask some questions. We can always have Brian back on for more conversations and appreciate you being part of the journey and coming along on this journey. Let's jump in. Welcome to The Mandate, a show featuring intimate conversations about men's mental health, masculinity, and identity. We bring you stories to inspire you, experts to guide you, and the tools you need to become the man you truly want to be. It's time to sit back, relax, and open up. Live from The Mandate Studio in Austin, Texas, here's your host, Adam Hoffman. What's up, friends, and welcome to tonight's episode. I'd like to introduce you to Brian. He's an executive coach who is passionate about helping startup CEOs transform into amazing leaders. He's been an entrepreneur. He's worked in VC a little bit. But uh, Brian, I'm excited to have you share your story a little bit more with us. Welcome. I'm excited to be here, Adam. It's good to be with you. Cool. Well, how are you doing? I'm good, man. I am uh, I'm doing well today. It's It's Wednesday. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, it's, um, it's hard to keep track of time these days. I think I was reflecting on this with my wife the other day. Um, uh, time seems like it's been blurring a lot, uh, recently. Um, I think largely because of the pandemic, um, but probably for a number of other reasons as well. But, um, you know, I use those as signals that I should just check in with myself um and get present and presently i'm feeling uh excited and um and happy to be in in the presence today very cool yeah i've been hearing more and more from people that the days are what what day is it it's day day you know? <laughs> yeah and then every now and again you'll get the like whoa it's friday and then you'll get the the sunday scaries or mopey mondays i don't know whatever um alliteration you'd like to put in front of the day of the week when you realize what day it actually is. And I think just with everything else blurring so much together too, work, family, being sick, being at home, you know, there's less kind of coming and going that signifies the beginning and the end of things. That's right. That, yeah, it really makes me wonder, will we settle into this? Or what what does the, the blend and the balance look like as things start to open up, people get more vaccinated? I mean, it's it'll be interesting. Yeah, my wife was actually joking the other day because I, I think I was saying something like, I can't wait for it to be Friday. And and my wife was basically just like, what's the difference? All the days are the same. There's no reason to get excited about Friday. It's sort of this arbitrary distinction. And uh, I was like, yeah, you're kind of right. Uh, at least that's the way it feels. So it's, it's I think to your point, it's, um, it's definitely drawing attention to all the structures that we normally take for granted for uh, marking time and separating time and, you know, uh, fitting all of our, our, our uh, attention into these neat little containers that we call days of the week. <laughs> That's right. Our neat little containers. And we have many of them. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about probably a couple of them today. So let's start off. Tell us about uh, who, who is Brian? What are you up to? And I'd love to get into your your journey with mental health. Yeah, um, where to start? So, who am I? Um, you know, I, I find that to be an increasingly um, difficult and also easy question to answer. If that makes sense, um, <laughs> I just I am. I think. Um, who am I? Uh, you know, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go do the traditional like background thing. And where I'm at sure. now, just uh, just for the sake of meeting folks where they are. So, um, 
Uh, I'm a former founder, um, spent time uh, in startups uh, for uh, over a decade as a CEO, um, spent a, a stint in VC and product management. So I've worn a few different hats um, in the uh, startup ecosystem. And these days I'm an executive coach. And uh, what that really means is that I spend all day working with CEOs and execs of early stage startups and really just helping them transform the way they're showing up as leaders. And I'm happy to go into more detail about what that means in, in, in specifics, um, but that's kind of how I'm spending my time right now and where I'm putting most of my energy when I'm not uh, being a husband and being a father. And um, yeah, you know, that's very much tied with my own journey with mental health as well, which is um, uh, an ongoing process. But um, yeah, uh, with, with mental health, I think there's probably uh, quite a few places to go there. Um, but, uh, you know, well, tell us, tell us more about when did you first have your sort of like, oh, I have these thoughts and feelings and I'm not quite sure what to do with them. Maybe I should talk mm. to somebody about it. Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, the first time I, I came to a realization that perhaps I need to seek some help and some support was around 2014. So that was towards the tail end of um, running this startup called Photocracy. And um, I was finding myself in a situation where the amount of stress I was enduring just felt totally crushing. Um, I was dealing with a co-founder departure. I was dealing with a, a company that was running low on runway um, and not feeling like I had a lot of different avenues or, or, or ways to get myself out of that situation. Um, and so I remember I hired um, an executive coach back then. I didn't know what that was at the time. Um, all I knew was that I, I really needed some support to help me get through that period. And um, uh, that was with a wonderful uh, coach and human being named Anna Maria Nino Mercia. Um, and uh, she really she really helped me learn um, just the, the, the skill and the art of developing my own self-awareness. And I think developing my own self-awareness was foundational to taking care of myself, right? So I think when, when we think about this idea of mental health, uh, that's such a central concept. Um, how can we care for ourselves if we don't know ourselves? How can we care for ourselves if we don't understand um, what's happening for us, what we're needing at any given moment, um, what gives us energy, what, what drains us of energy, and, and, and so on and so forth. And so that was, that was 2014 where um, it was in this professional context, but really I think it was a human-to-human -human support structure that was really, really uh, impactful for me. And, um, and then a few years later, I also started to work with um, therapists and uh, and uh, start adopting meditation and so on, so we can kind of get into that. But that was my first, my first, uh, I think, um, exposure and first moment where I was like, I need help. That was that was quite memorable for me. Yeah, it seems like coaching for sure has been something that has felt like it's been reserved for executives, senior leaderships. It's not something that like you know, my dad has a coach or my friend who work some middle level manager job has a coach or something like it, it's seems like it's something that's starting to go mainstream, but that's almost like at people's first kind of dip their toe in, if you will, to making sense of what's going on up in here, which then yeah. eventually translates to like what's going on and, you know, all of this. So we, at what point were you like, ah, you know what, I would like a little bit more than just coaching. I really want to dig into what's happening up here. Let's explore therapy. Uh, well, you know, that was, that was, um, that's a great question. And that, that came up for me during a particularly challenging time for me in my personal life. And so um, not many people know this, um, my close friends and family do, but in 2017, my wife and I, we're going through a really, really tough period. And um, the relationship was really starting to break down. And if you zoomed out, you could notice that the both of us were really like locked into these reactive patterns that started to, to um, exacerbate the other. Um, and uh, um, uh, it, it came to a point where it really seemed like uh, the marriage was gonna come to an end. Um, and so that was, the point where I said, okay, 
if I'm going to survive this, I'm really going to need some help. And um, I decided to um, get some help from a therapist um, and uh, really just do the work, do the work on understanding um, what was going on for me, do the work on just helping relieve my anxiety and develop, develop some coping strategies. And, uh, you know, the there's a happy ending to this um uh, the the marriage uh, eventually recovered we were able to reconcile we were able to move forward uh, even though for a long time it really felt like it was going completely in the opposite direction and interestingly enough i think the thing that enabled us to reconcile and to um to repair things was uh my accepting of the fact that it was ending my 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 acceptance um and my coming to that moment um I think it produced a, a shift in my own mindset and my own ability to relate. And um, that made a huge difference. And, and the thing is that it, it couldn't have been manufactured, right? It had to come from this authentic place. And, and, and I, had I had genuinely arrived at a point where I said, okay, if, if this is what's going to happen, like I'm going to accept that. I'm going to be able to move forward with it, right? So. Um, uh, therapy certainly helped me, um, uh, in, in arriving at that place. Um, mindfulness meditation, um, supported that as well. And, um, you know, it, it helped me connect more with myself. I think that that was a huge part of it. Um, especially in relationships, especially in, in primary relationships and romantic relationships, I think it's easy to, um, inadvertently lose yourself in it and you become disconnected in it. And, um, you know, you're, you're no longer giving your full self to your partner, um, because you're serving some other agenda that you're probably not even aware of. So, uh, I think that went off in a little bit of a different direction, but yeah, that, that was, uh, that was quite a journey for me. Absolutely. Well, I, I just want to first acknowledge the vulnerability that it takes to share something like that. So thank you first. I'm, I'm grateful for your, your openness on that and so much good wisdom there. I mean, even just yeah, you went off on a tangent, but I think that that's part of it is just following where it feels right to go. And you mentioned awareness of yourself. And I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that probably meditation and mindfulness helped with that. But was there anything else that you could point to that really helped you see, oh, I need to go, I need to look inside in order to really take care of the stuff that's outside of me that, that you care about? Yeah, it's a good question. If there was anything else, um, you know, there were, there were a number of books I remember reading at the time that were, that were quite helpful in, in supporting that experience. And, um, I remember going and reading the book Uncon or conscious uncoupling. And that was, that was really meant to be a support for me to kind of go through that process. Um, and even though we didn't end up actually uh, going through with the split, I think it helped me, uh, acquire certain concepts around, um, uh, you know, the ways in which our childhood experiences might impact us and how that might show up in the relationship, how that might've led you to that relationship in the first place, um, in, in this very, um, unconscious way. And I think when you're able to shine a light on those ideas, um, that's when you're able to take ownership over those. That's when you're able to take responsibility for those. There's no longer um, the kind of hidden forces that are going to dictate your behavior. So I think um, uh, certainly books and reading were helpful and also just getting support from friends and, and a family, you know, um, it, it takes a village and, and uh, no man is an island, right? And so um, being able to be myself and, and, um, and show that vulnerability and get that support from others. I think, um, it, it reconnected me, um, uh, to other humans in a way that I think I had been neglecting for a while. And so I think that was really instrumental as well. Yeah. There's so much power in that. The idea of connecting with ourselves enable us to connect with the people that we care about in a much more, in a deeper way, in a more authentic way that fits with us and it resonates with me. It makes me think about energy expenditure mm -hmm. and just how much energy, how expensive it is to be your inauthentic self 
at the end of the day, like that's what I, I've found is like when I'm not being me, I'm, I'm drained. And it's like, when I'm on these conversations with people like you, I feel like I could go forever because I just, I just get to be me and I can be <clears throat> curious and vulnerable and authentic. And like, that's what, that's what ends up lighting me up. That's right. And <clears throat> you were going down, I think you were going down a path just briefly about your feelings along the way and maybe how that was showing up um, in your, in your body, which I know is something that we wanted to talk about a little bit. So can you share more about maybe not even in the context of then, but now, how do you check in with yourself and how you're feeling, like even physical sensations? What, is, what does that do for you? What does that look like? Yeah, and that's a great question, Adam. And I think um, I'm, I'm noticing myself actually hesitating uh, just to even to, to bring awareness to it um, in real time, because this is, uh, I'm acknowledging that this is an area that's still very much an area of growth and learning for me. Um, so I'm noticing my own, uh, hesitation and, and anxiety around not saying something stupid. <laughs> so I'm going to name that. There um, you go. And so, uh, yeah, there's that that voice that is just like trying to protect me. Be like, don't say something stupid. Um, Do you so, have a name for that voice, by the way? That's a great question. Um, I don't actually, which is funny because that I, I often ask people to name that that version of that voice for for themselves when I'm working with individuals. Um, there's a few voices in there, uh, um, uh, but this particular one, the one that's like, don't say something stupid, uh, nameless to date. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, but anyways, back to the, the question of like, how, how I, you know, get in touch with my own body and my own emotions. It's, it's something that's still an ongoing, um, area of growth for me. But, uh, what I find is, uh, the first place to start is just what what is it that's my most pronounced felt sensation and, and the thing that for me i i notice is is often very present is this sort of i think there's two sensations one is this tightness in the gut or this heaviness in the gut and also um a constriction in my uh my lower chest and just kind of my breathing cavity and that's often associated with anxiety it's often associated with uh, feelings of doubt and uncertainty, uh, which um, tend to be quite present for me. And, uh, you know, the thing I've learned about being present to those feelings is that um, ignoring them uh, uh, almost never improves uh, whatever situation I'm finding myself in. Um, and uh, the way I'm relating to them these days is simply just to um, pay attention and notice when they're there and to um, show a bit of care for that. Uh, so I think that my, my current way of relating to um, emotions in general is to really honor the fact that there's signals my body is sending me and that my brain and nervous system are sending me and that they're inviting me to pay attention and to um, attend to some need that perhaps I'm not um, uh, putting a lot of energy into at the moment. And you know, I'm careful not to fix it. I'm careful not to try to make it go away so much as just be present to it. And in my experience, by doing that, by showing a little bit of presence and some care, they tend to just relax by themselves. They don't need to um, be fixed or they don't need to be shunned. Um, I think even just being recognized helps the feeling itself sort of um, chill a little bit, sort of relax, if that makes any sense. And I, and I realize I'm speaking about it as if it's a separate entity, but that's the way I conceptualize it these days. It, it's that these, these different feelings are parts um, that I'm recognizing and I, I find, I have found that it's helpful to treat them um, as uh, kind of like a cast of characters internally, if that makes any sense. You know, it sounds like you also approach it with a lot of curiosity first as opposed to judgment, like it's, it's good or bad, or you, you said you try to not fix it. Just like, hey, it's here. Where did, where did this come from? What is this thing? And that's almost the way that you can let it pass or subside or you know serve you in the way that, that it needs to serve you, but not control you, which I think is sometimes what can happen with our emotions is it's just like, it's almost like you get hooked on them and yeah. then it just feeds it. It feeds the beast, man. It just gets more, yeah. more angry or more nervous or, you know, more excited, which 
you know, don't get me wrong. There's this good, good certain level of excitement, but then there's like too much excitement. Yeah. Um, so yeah. have you found anything that helps you make it so that, you know, you're only overcome with emotion when you want to be, as opposed to when the emotions want you to be, if that makes yeah. sense? That's a, that's a, that's such a great question. Um, I, I think I'm hearing you describe this idea of, um, helping our, like, how do we allow our emotions to, um, be our allies and our partners and, and not to be this kind of, um, uh, overwhelming phenomena that just like, we have no choice in, in real, in, in, you know, we're just kind of victims to them. And, uh -huh. you know, look, I'm a human being like anybody else. I definitely have moments where I'm completely overwhelmed and, um, just, uh, you know, if I'm being honest, just being feeling real, real sorry for myself. And that's, that's what I notice for myself when I'm feeling overwhelmed, um, and, and, and triggered and flooded and just completely unable, like I'm unregulated. Um, what I know to be true, uh, th from experience is I'm, 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 I'm kind of just looking for someone to take care of me. Um, and, and, and so the, the overwhelmed feelings are sort of a, a way that manifests and um it's it's not always easy to get out of that state but what i what i have found is just allowing the people around me to know that sometimes that happens for me has been really really helpful because um, if i can't catch myself maybe someone else can um and um the other thing is just the more i'm able to get familiar with that state even if it's like that triggered flooded state um, the more I can have at least some presence of mind to exercise some choice. So if I'm noticing I'm kind of going into the pattern, one, one thing that I have found to be helpful to kind of be a little bit of an interruption for that pattern, if it's kind of going a little bit too much, is really just to um, ask, uh, how can I be doing this better? Um, and, and, and more more practically, this is something that my wife and I sometimes do. So if, if, if my wife and I are getting into an argument or some sort of intense conflict, um, there's this question that we've come up with that um, admittedly we don't use as much as we, we probably could, but the question is essentially just how could we be doing this better, right? Mm. And it's a little bit of a, um, <laughs> are you familiar with the, the kind of uh, combo breaker meme? um <laughs> no yeah okay so anyways it's it's like uh i'll get into it but <laughs> i mean I'm, I'm familiar with combo breakers in general if we're talking about like video games yeah, yeah yeah so it's like you know so like um it's like it's coming from video games but there's this kind of uh internet meme i think where you know you'll see a pattern of uh of all of the same thing or all something that's all very the same likeness and then all of a sudden the, the next item in the series is completely different. And then they'll go like combo breaker. Right. And it's kind of <laughs> like, it's kind of what happens for us emotionally. Like if, if, if my wife and I are kind of going back and forth and we're, we're triggering each other and we're getting all like into our own heads and, and our own patterns, I think that question, how can we be doing this better is sort of a centering intervention because the reason I like that, that, that question as simple as it is so much is because um, one, you got the word we, right? So it's a reminder that this is, we're a team, we're a unit. This isn't you versus me. We're on the same side. Um, and then that, how can we is, um, I mean, it just, it, 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 it kind of points to possibility, right? So I think that when, I don't know about you, but when I feel really triggered, I kind of get into this zone where, um, I'm just tunnel visioned. And it feels like whatever I'm feeling right now is the only thing I'm ever going to feel ever again. And um, I'm fundamentally closed off from possibility of some other experience. So when I say, or when we say, how can we do this better? And then like do this better, I think helps reinforce that idea that like this requires some active, you know, some action and, 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 and stepping in, into some new choice. Um, I think it helps us uh, just like kind of snap out of it a little bit, right? Um, for, cause it's easy to say we should attend to our feelings and, and really get in touch with all those and, and, and whatnot. Um, but sometimes when you're like, you know, in the, in the really red zone, sometimes you just need something to like get back into a more regulated state and just like snap out of it. Um, and then you can kind of tend to some of the more, you know, soft wounded feelings a little bit later. Uh, I've found, you know, it's a little bit of a, uh, uh, 
fire alarm that you're pulling uh, or, you know, break in case of emergency sort of thing. I'm going to forever just say and hear combo breaker. Yes. In my, in my brain from now on is that like little, when I need to insert like, Oh, this thing's run. It's about to be a runaway train so, mm -hmm. combo breaker. I also, in a more serious note, I love the creating possibility with the right words, especially we, if you're talking about some, somebody else. And that seems, that sounds like something that works not just in with your wife or your significant other, but like any other human is it's not about like, yes to I statements if we're conveying how we feel, but if you're, if you're triggering each other and you can insert that, how might we, or how can we, I really love that. That's a great takeaway yeah. for, for me. It also remind, reminded me of uh, when I was in therapy with in a past relationship that I ultimately ended. Yeah. When we were in therapy, I learned about this concept uh, called DPA and I, I don't even, I can't remember what it stands for, but it, it was a, the term that the therapist used to talk about when we really reach our, our triggered point, like we're, we're past actually engaging in a conversation to resolve conflict mm -hmm. and your, your executive functions start shutting off. You're not listening. Like your body is basically going into fight, flight, or freeze, um, um, states and so it's yep. like you just need to, to call it off and it, it at that point in time it was so bad that we had like a word that we would mm -hmm. say but like mm -hmm. when we got that triggered and it was just like conversations over whoever called it you know if they said combo breaker they <laughs> yeah. were then responsible for re-engaging the other person to say hey let's continue this conversation tomorrow morning right. um but sometimes yeah it does it does get to that point it also makes me think about like what's the equivalent of that for us as individuals you know, when you got those voices in your head that just like won't shut up, how can you combo break them or be like, hey, I'm too triggered. I got to come back to you guys later. Like this is, this is too much. I'll be right back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a great question. I think it, it, it's going to ultimately comes down to to the individual. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think one thing that's really been helpful for me is it's such a simple concept, but I, I learned this um, from my first coach, Anna Maria, the, the concept of... Um, um, affect labeling or just labeling our emotions, naming our emotions. Um, and, uh, it, it's, it's, as, it's as simple as, you know, saying, Hey, I'm noticing that I'm feeling anxious because, you know, fill in the blank. There's some narrative that's spinning around in my head and, um, and I'm feeling this way because I'm believing that narrative. And, and for me, I think that, um, I found naming my emotions to be really, uh, really useful because it's, it, it's inherently creating a little bit of distance between yourself and the felt sensation. Not that the felt sensation is not important, but, um, it means that I'm no longer so tightly fused with it. Right. So when, you know, when I was saying earlier about how I can sometimes go, and I think many people go through this experience of feeling like my current experience is all I'm ever going to feel ever again. Um, it's kind of, that's what's going on, right? We, we are so tightly wound up in that feeling um, and, and really just like to our core identity in that moment, we can't imagine anything else. And so by recognizing that that is just a temporary sensation that will pass and um, by shining a light on it through something like naming the emotion, we're able to like get a little bit of distance, right? And if we, if we can get a little bit of distance, maybe we can get a lot more distance, right? Again, not because we want it to go away so much as we're recognizing that just like a phenomenon happening in our consciousness is happening in our, in our awareness and we can tend to it, but not be sucked into it, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it also reminds me of this term that I came across recently called gender normative alexithymia. I think hmm. it's... I'm probably butchering that last word, but it basically means like, uh, how, how gender norms, the impact that gender norms has on our ability to articulate things with, with language. And in mm. this case, it's specifically referring to the article was about how guys have a really hard time labeling their feelings. Mm. And then it's like, it's a, there's actually a term for it. Um, because it's, it's become such a, such a phenomenon. Yeah. And it sounds like you generally don't have issues with naming your feelings but has that always been the case yeah that's a great question i you know i um it's it's still a work in progress to be totally honest with you i think for 
when I when I think about the feelings that I often can identify, and then also the ones that are a little bit less accessible or a little bit harder for me to um, to conjure up or to experience or to name, um, I think I, I see what this phenomenon you're describing at work. Um, so anxiety and worry are certainly very, very present for me. Um, um, but weirdly enough, uh, it's, it's less common for me to experience anger, which is, which is interesting because, um, anger tends to be one of those feelings that is considered socially acceptable for men. Right. And then maybe everything else is, is maybe more taboo or, or not, not as acceptable. Um, and so, you know, my relationship to anger is, is something that, um, is still something that I think there's a lot of material to work through there. Um, I think my relationship to, um, to, to lightness and, and playfulness is also something that I certainly have access to, but it doesn't come as naturally for me as I think for a lot of other people. And, you know, is that due to um, my gender and the way I was raised and socialized? I have to imagine that's got, there's gotta be some, something there for sure. Um, you know, my dad was a, a fairly stoic character growing up and, and also wasn't a particularly um, present uh, parent. Um, I, I'm not making a judgment. I'm just simply stating it what it was. And so, um, you know, I think I, I, I took cues from that and I took cues from also the people around me um, in, in uh, various contexts. But yeah, it's something, you know, going back to your question, like uh, what access do I have to these different emotional experiences and, and how might I uh, be in touch with those and to express those and to even identify them. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of makes me think about um, a, a palette of colors, right? And, and, and so um, I might have language and the ability to identify a certain range, um, but it's certainly not like, you know, 16 million different colors, right? It, it might be a hundred or something just to, 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 you know, proportionally for, for, uh, if we're talking about, uh, modern, um, computing, whereas, you know, back in the 1990s, maybe we were lucky to have 16 colors. Right. And I've certainly met people who, who speak like they're in 16 color land where, you know, we talk about what they're feeling and they're like, I feel good. I feel bad. You know, and that's kind of like the, the extent to which they can identify it. That's like their level of granularity. So I think part of it is just, um, developing, a vocabulary for these things. Um, and if we don't have the range of vocabulary, um, then I think it literally, we, we have less access to some of these felt experiences. Um, so that's kind of part of my ongoing education. My wife had this idea the other day. I think she, I think she might have saw it somewhere on Instagram because don't we see everything on Instagram these days? Yeah. <laughs> um, but like we did this chocolate tasting certification when we were at our heyday of making bean to bar chocolate at home. And we found it so hard in the beginning to articulate the specific flavors that we were tasting. Mm -hmm. It was just like, this tastes like chocolate. Like <laughs> right. maybe this chocolate is a little bit more roasty than the previous chocolate or it's right. smoother. And one of the things they did in this program was they gave us a taste wheel. And so it was like, okay, these are probably on the periphery, the things that you will be able to tap into most easily, like chocolate flavor. Okay, great. You got that one. Okay. Within chocolate, is it like nutty? Is it sweet? And it started then opening up and helping you get more and more specific into being able to say like, oh, this chocolate is deep chocolatey flavor with some berries, a hint of dried cherry and apricot, right? Yeah. Like now we're yeah. talking like we're, you know, a wine sommelier or something. Yeah. But it makes me, it made me think a lot. It was in the context of how can we help people describe their emotions more? And like, what if we had one of those wheels in front of us that was like, I think I feel what I'm calling anxiety, but then within anxiety, there's like all these sub feelings that you could be having. Yeah. Well, there's, there's good news. Those things exist. They're called the yes. Junto feelings wheel or emotion wheel. That's um, been what it is. Yeah. And, 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 um, th it's exactly what you're describing, right? It's kind of like it starts with like the base emotions and then they kind of fan out into more levels of specificity. And, you know, as I was, as listening to you, Adam, describe his experience with, you know, getting to the baseline and then is it, is it like more of this or less that it, it it's funny. It kind of reminded me of like when you go to the optometrist 
and you're getting fitted for glasses and you're like, is that clear or is that clear? Right. And it's kind of like, you're going through this like progressive a B test sort of, um, series to get to the optimal. Right. But it's sort of like, like how it works with emotions. You have to be able to, well, I think one of the important things is you have to spend the time to allow yourself to feel them in the first place. Um, and, uh, the more you're able to sit in presence with those feelings, the more you can start to differentiate. Um, but it, it takes work. You can't just like read about it in a book. That's a thing. It's, it's, it's very, very much experiential. And one of the things that I notice in a lot of the folks that I work with, I happen to work with a lot of men. Um, I notice it in myself as well is that it's very easy to live up here and not down here. Right. So like in my head, I can point to ideas of different emotional granularity, but if I'm not actually uh, feeling those myself, then it's just this weird abstraction. Um, and, and so I can never actually truly empathize with someone or I can never really point to what I'm really feeling if, I'm, if all I'm doing is intellectualizing it um, on a regular basis. And, and that's really as i'm describing that i'm kind of calling myself out and, and reminding myself to continually do that work um because uh, i know for me it's really easy just to like point to the thing that i saw in 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 the book or the article or the whatever it was and and somehow think i know what i'm talking about without actually having to spend the time to um, experience it for myself if that makes any sense yeah i'd be curious what do you think that de- we've talked about manhood a little bit now like, what do you think this definition of what it means to be a man has an impact on our ability to, to tap more into these feelings and our emotions? Yeah, it's, um, it's such a, it's, well, I'm grabbing onto that, that question of like, what does it mean to be a man? Um, as I listen to you and, and it's, um, I, I find it to be a hard question to consider, um, I almost, I almost frame it um, right off the bat as what you're not allowed to be in the beginning. Um, mm. Like, <laughs> it's so funny. I, I was reminded of, um, I, I'm reminding myself now of this uh, thing that I, I, I experienced on Twitter a few months back. And um, I don't know, maybe you saw this. Uh, I, I, I tweeted um, something along the lines of, uh, uh, is anyone else just crying more than usual these days? And, uh, and, uh, wow, what a day that was because (laughs) I had, I had, uh, I, I don't even know how many people were in my mentions that day, but, uh, I, I was getting all these replies and quote tweets, um, that were basically somewhere along the lines of, um, this guy's kind of a pansy. Uh, right. Wow. Like, no guy, kidding. Oh my God. I am using I, I very, think that, was the, light that was the reason here. I reached out to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm, I'm using somewhat, somewhat softened language here. I think it was a much harsher language. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, you, you saw this play out. You saw both men and women, um, uh, attacking and mocking me for daring to share this idea that I maybe, um, some sadness and tears were more present for me. And I thought that was, frankly, I thought that was pretty fucking sad that, that people were so insecure in their idea of what being a man meant that to see a man, uh, express this sort of vulnerability somehow, um, made them feel the need to attack me for it. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, the, it, it makes me kind of sad for for them as people and, and, and for society because I think that um, it's important to be able to access that. And I don't think that I, th- I think the thing that, look to, to to show some empathy for those people. I, I think that the charitable explanation um, is that they the the concept that they're pointing to is that men are supposed to be strong and not weak. And men are supposed to be protectors and not the not the victims. And so to cry means that you are somehow inherently not strong and and you're vulnerable prey in, in, in a certain sense. Like you're not capable of taking care of yourself um, and you need others to do that for you. And, you know, honestly, I think that that just points to a certain level of rigidity as to what vulnerability even means and what expressing sadness even means. 
Um, so, you know, as I think about what, what being a man or, or just the concept of masculinity um, means to me personally in the modern era, you know, the, the main thing that comes up is this idea of uh, the first word that comes up is strength. And um, I think a lot of people have different definitions for, for what strength is, but to me, strength is merely the capacity to take care of our concerns um, and the willingness to take care of our concerns, right? So, um, you know, typically we think about strength in terms of like raw physical power, right? To move something, to strike something, to break something, whatever, or to, or to build something. Um, and the, all of those things are perfectly valid, but I think also um, uh, strength means that you take care of concerns emotionally. It means that you are present to whatever's going on for you. It means that you're aware of what's going on for other people. And if they need help, then you're able to help them in, in certain ways. It means in the family unit, if there are concerns that need taken care of, then um, to me, strength means uh, the capacity and the, um, the ability to move forward and to take care of those concerns. So, um, you know, it's, if we can't make room for being sad and all that, then I think that's an unfortunate, um, reality for many people. And I'm, and I, and my hope is that that changes over time. I, I, I am optimistic. I, I think that, uh, on the macro level that is shifting over time. Um, and what I experienced with this, uh, uh, you know, flood of, of attacks and, and replies on Twitter was, uh, you know, it, there was a certain corner of the internet that was activated, uh, but that's not necessarily representative of the broader population. I secretly, and maybe I'm going to regret saying this, but like, I can't wait for the day for that corner of the internet to come for me. <laughs> I, uh, wow. Now I, I want to know what that, what, what you have in your head as you say that. <laughs> I think it's just, it's a sign that like the message has gotten out enough that they feel compelled to to come and try to tear it down. Yeah. Um, which is fine. You know, they, they get to go and do that. And, and anyways, so, sidebar, what, what I really wanted to say for, for everything that you were just sharing about that is that it's, I come back to that, the full spectrum of color, mm -hmm. right. Or, or tools in the toolbox, Ch choose your analogy for what's available to men. And actually the thing that just popped into my head was like, when we got, when color TV came out, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, oh my gosh, holy cow, there's this whole, whole new world. Or even there, there's a movie that I can't place the name of it when like the colors start to come back. And mm -hmm. it's like, oh my gosh, there's this whole, whole world around me that now exists that I have access to. That's what I see. That's what I imagine this like awakening, if you will, that's happening. And I think it's really a re reawakening because from some of the other guests that I've had, it sounds like there's, um, there's some pretty good research that it's the pendulum really swung over the last hundreds, thousands of years. And that, mm. you know, there, there used to be this culture of, you know, embracing the whole human and right. not just these parts of it that have to be, you know, the strong warrior commander fixer problem solver type that historically there's been much more archetypes for men to tap into that we all have inside of us. And it's just been unfortunate that it's kind of turned into strength has a very narrow definition when your definition of strength is much wider and, and all encompassing, which frankly feels more liberating to me. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it's, I think you're totally right. And I think this, this idea of, of embracing the whole human um, and, and having this kind of integrated person, um, my sense is that we are as a society moving more and more in that direction. And the, this kind of like, um, I'll call it like a social immune response. Um, mm. like when you have like these like corners of the internet, that get like activated and triggered in their own way, um, is, you know, there, there, there's this kind of rigidity that they hold where, um, they, uh, you mentioned archetype, right? So for, for them, there's this kind of, um, or statement for them. It's like, either you can be strong as a man or you can kind of be in touch with your emotions and, uh, you know, have this full spectrum, but you can't be both. Right. And I think that's where a lot of people get confused. They, they think that somebody who, a man who's in touch with their 
felt experience and, and emotions somehow can't exhibit strength, can't take care of their own concerns, can't stand up for themselves, which is, I, I think, I, I understand where that confusion comes from, but I think that's where the fundamental error is being committed. And so I think that, um, you know, moving forward into the modern era, it's kind of, you, we, you want both. You want, you want wholly integrated humans who can express all of those things. And there's room for the masculine. There's room for the feminine, whatever the hell either of those mean anymore. I, you know, frankly, I think it's ever evolving concept. Um, and, you know, wouldn't it be a shame to live on this planet without access to certain experiences that we ourselves are just cutting ourselves off from, but it's there if we want it. I mean, that seems kind of sad. It really does. Yeah, and limiting and painful and stressful and all those things that I think most of us are trying to not have have in our lives. You, you also made me think about, for me at least, the, the emotion that I tend to feel when something's like really uncomfortable or I'm uncertain about it is fear. Like that's mm. the one that'll, that'll come up. And there's different flavors of fear, obviously. But it, it's almost like I imagine when people have the visceral reaction to men crying or men showing emotion or guys like us being vulnerable right now about our feelings is like that triggered something inside of them. That's uncomfortable. They don't, somebody doesn't have a way to describe it. They don't know what to do with it. And it's like, right. okay, well, if I don't know what this is, this is bad. It needs to go away. Mm -hmm. Or, or it's like, you know, what we were talking about earlier of the, you know, one of the voices that sits on your shoulder that maybe it's, their dad or their uncle or a coach, you know, who's yelling at them being like, don't show your feelings. Like right. that's for pussies that's right. and other horrible words that are much worse than that. Um, that then feels like, okay, well then my, the only way that I know how to react to that is with force and the strength that I've, that I've come to learn. I, I think that's completely right. I think that what you're describing is um, a certain set of conditioning. That's really, really common where, um, you, you know, everyone has to develop a certain model of the world, a certain worldview, and that explains how things ought to be and how things function and, and what, what is order, what is chaos and, and what's in control and out of control. And so when you have generations of people who grow up with those, um, their sort of, um, father figures and those ideas of what a man is supposed to be. And then, um, that comes into conflict with, with with men who um, maybe don't exactly fit that mold, I think it's completely natural for us to feel that fear response. We're like, this isn't right. Something is totally. really, really wrong here. And you know, our, our, our programming is gonna tell us to either flee it or destroy it, right? Um, and, and those are our, some of our baser tendencies when, when we're experiencing fear. Um, and you know, it comes as no surprise that, that some people respond in that way. And I mean, geez, thank God that we have prefrontal cortexes because um, if we did it, then we'd probably be still stuck in tribes killing each other all the time, right? So, um, so, so I, I think it's 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 why conversations like this are really important. It's why uh, the way that we model for others and the um, uh, the opinions that we express in public um, are so important um, because every single thing that we do is a uh, vote for what we consider to be acceptable or unacceptable. So I think it really is kind of incumbent on, on us to, to take that responsibility and to, um, you know, shape the world that we want to see. Yeah, for sure. I'm curious, how do you take kind of all this work that you've done on yourself, the training that you've had on your coach, how does this show up with working with, CEOs and executives, like, are they wrestling with these types of things? Is it, are they in some other type of universe and realm? Like, are these, do you, do you have similar conversations like these with your clients? Yeah. You know, so I think it's rare to have a coaching conversation and bring in the context of masculinity per se. Um, uh, I haven't done it yet. Maybe that will happen at some point. Uh, but I think I think where where this ties in uh, into the coaching work, um, you know, what I would point to is like a lot of my job is to take what whatever challenge or whatever goal is in front of the the person, the client that I'm working with, and 
I'm not, you know, I making the distinction that my job isn't to help them solve their problem or, or to meet their goals so much as help them uh, really evolve into the person or the type of person who can meet that challenge or that goal, if that makes sense. Um, and so that in practice comes down to understanding. So kind of what's my internal ecosystem doing? Like what's, what are, what are the patterns that I notice are, are taking place as I'm meeting this situation? Um, what parts of those patterns are serving me? What parts of those patterns are not serving me? Um, how can I start to get a better understanding of those things um, so that I can then step forward into some more conscious choice? So sometimes um, we might get into a conversation around how a particular individual's worldview was formed and maybe they did learn certain acceptable or unacceptable uh, ideas or messages early on in childhood that might come up. It's not necessarily the, the focus of, of the conversation, um, but you know, to the extent that we can get a better understanding of um, what's really going on for that person, um, then there's this kind of magic that starts to uh, unfold because all of a sudden the, the mystery of why some, whatever situation is so hard starts to become a little bit less mysterious. Um, and then that person can then make uh, a different type of choice. And that doesn't mean that whatever they're going to do next is easy. In fact, what I find is through coaching, um, it actually requires my clients to work even harder um, than they might normally, right? Sometimes we think, oh, I'm going to go uh, work with a coach and they're like, they're going to solve all my problems and life is magically better. It's actually completely the opposite. It's like, you know, now, now that you know what's going on for you, now that you know what your automatic patterns are, um, you don't have an excuse anymore. Like you, ha now you're going to, you have to go and make the choice that you know is, is, is you're supposed to be doing here. Um, I don't mean supposed to be, it's, it's still up to them, but, um, you know, so a phrase that sometimes comes up is that, uh, uh, the things that we see are necessary are often simple, but not easy. And, and, and it, I, I see that play out time and time again in, in the work that I do with my clients. So, um, yeah, just, just, it's like when you, when you, when you really start to figure out what's been holding you back, um, that's a scary place to be because you, you can't make excuses anymore. You can't point and blame some other person or some other outside reason why you're not, you know, um, uh, able to uh, get your team aligned or, uh, you know, build your product fast enough or, uh, you know, whatever it is that the, that, that that particular client is going for that day. Um, so it's, it's, it's an interesting sort of situation for me to be in because I'm, I'm often finding myself in the place of, um, having to challenge people really just, you know, I'm not here to pat you on the head and make you feel better. Like I'll make, I'll help you feel better to the extent that you can become more regulated and be in a place where you can really start to do this work in a productive way. But there's still the other side of it. It was like, but okay, this is all leading to some shift in your doing or your being um, that will get you closer to where you want to go. Um, and that's where, you know, really the hard work comes in. For sure. What do you love the most about being a coach? Mm. You know, I think the thing I, there, there are two things I really, really love about um, working as a coach. The first is that I get to learn so much every day. You know, I, you know, I, I probably learn more from my clients and they learn and, and, their interactions with me, to be totally honest with you. So I, I find that uh, I'm, I'm constantly um, gaining new insight about myself and other human beings um, on, on a regular basis, and that's awesome. Um, I think the second thing I really love about coaching is you, you kind of just get to be witness to human beings that are um, making choices that they previously thought were not available to them. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's inherently empowering and you, you get to watch them really shift in the way that they're showing up. And I, I try to remind myself that it's not really me doing that. It's them doing that. Um, I just get to be a part of it. Um, so 
it's 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 not always straightforward. It's not always um, wrapped up with a neat, nice bow. Um, but when you see those shifts happen over time, um, I mean, you, you get to watch, you know, human evolution happening right before your eyes. I mean, geez, I, I can't think of anything better to do with my time, to be totally honest with you. That sounds really special. And I can, while I've never been a coach, I've, I've had moments where people have said, Hey, th thanks for coaching. And I was kind of like, Oh, I didn't, didn't realize that was a thing. I feel like you just gave me more than I, than I gave to you. So I think I should be saying thanks in reverse, right. um, which feels like the, the first point that you touched on. So let's see with our final couple minutes here, I'd love to know, do you, what's, what bit of wisdom would you like to leave uh, men? Cause that's who we're mostly talking to, but obviously any humans who might be watching this, what sort of wisdom can you leave them with? That's a great question. So something that I notice in myself and something that I notice um, among a lot of men that I work with is that it's very, very easy to spend your days um, not giving yourself any time to be with yourself. And um, I think it's for a good reason because I, I think oftentimes um, we are spending our time uh, working a job, taking care of a family, um, uh, tending to the needs of our partners. And, um, I think there's a certain tendency among a lot of men to kind of like sacrifice themselves, um, in, in the name of some, some greater purpose you, you can call it. And it's easy to lose sight of the importance of spending time with yourself. Um, and, um, really just to slow down and check in with yourself, um, even for a little bit, uh, I noticed this sense of rushedness and tightness is very, very, uh, common for myself and for others. And so I think one of the simplest things that you can do for yourself is as a form of daily practice is to take five, 10, 15 minutes to, um, to really be with yourself and no one else. And, and that could be in the form of, uh, a contemplative practice like meditation or journaling or something else entirely. But I think um, if we as men and as human beings are going to go and uh, lead and create and um, really shape a better world, we have to make sure that we, um, as the vehicles that are going to do that, are, are, are properly taking care of uh, ourselves. So um, you can't do that if you're constantly going on overdrive and, um, and not getting a, giving yourself a tune-up. Uh, to use uh, uh, an automobile analogy. So uh, it, it doesn't take a lot, but just even a little bit, I think is really helpful. Love it. Very good. I will, I will take that into consideration, certainly more than I normally do uh, coming out of this conversation, which I really enjoyed. I, I can't thank you enough for coming on this mandate with me, for opening up, for being vulnerable, for setting a good example. Uh, I know that there's going to be a lot of folks that get a lot out of what you shared. So thank you so much for being here with me. It was an absolute pleasure, Adam. Really loved spending time with you, man. Thanks for listening to The Mandate with your host, Adam Hoffman. It's time to do your part in raising awareness of men's mental health, shifting the stigma, and having a positive impact on someone's life. Share this episode with a friend who could use some support and post it on your social channels. Have questions or thoughts? Text Adam at 512-980-3935. Find more episodes, upcoming live shows, and life-changing resources at MandateShow.com. Your mandate is to take your mental health seriously. Be courageous. Stay vulnerable. Live authentically. Until next time, y'all.